Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 21st edition of the Anchorage International Film Festival. We are so excited to be back on track this year after a really weird pandemic period. We are, however, this year um, a hybrid festival, so we are both virtual and live. That means we are physically in Alaska at our normal venues, and there is an audience, and there are filmmakers physical here in Alaska, which is wonderful. Finally, we couldn't do it last year, so we're really trying to make up for it this year. However, it is still a pandemic, and it is Alaska in December, so it's not always that easy to get here. That's why we are setting up this wonderful roundtable today with our awesome Canadian filmmakers, because we have a lot of Canadian filmmakers this year. Woo! <laughs> and awesome Canadian films. We couldn't be more excited about it. I'm going to start here by saying that we are so appreciative of the whole country of Canada who are actually sponsoring the festival, not only this year, but also last year. So thank you to the Consulate General of Canada. It's really appreciated. And yes, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, and I think that collaborations like this, it does lead to bigger things. And what we're seeing this year is we're seeing a clear spike in submissions from Canada. And we're seeing that we're getting, I mean, we're really getting top notch films from Canada. So we couldn't be more excited about that. And we are so happy to have you guys with us here. We have five filmmakers here now. Uh, we can start by introducing everybody going around here. I also just want to point out that we're all women, which I think is really awesome. It's a complete coincidence, but uh, but hooray for that. <laughs> Christine, we can start with you, please. Hey, well, I'm Christine Cook, and I am the co-director, co-writer, and producer of the short film Johnny Crow, which was made in Calgary, Alberta, as well as uh, it was animated in BC and around Alberta by Cree artist Jesse Coche. Wonderful. Welcome. Then we can go to Brianna and Gwyn, and you can introduce yourselves together. Hi, um, I'm Brianna. I'm Gwen Phillip. Hi. And uh, we co-wrote and uh, are also in a film called The Women's Hour. Uh, we're a comedy duo based in Toronto, uh, and uh, we're super excited to have our, our short film in the festival. And it's sort of, um, it's uh, sort of a surreal, campy, 1950s era. There's yeah. a lot going on, but it was definitely a uh, labor of love, and we're excited for more people to see it. And Gwen, both of you, you two actually both wrote it, produced it, and acted in the film. We did, yes, we did. <laughs> that is some serious multitasking right there. Yes, I feel like this is kind of how we do everything. Um, we're kind of used to it, but it's, you know, uh, very rewarding as well when you kind of are collaborating in, in this way and, and we're super excited to be part of this. So thank you for having us. Wonderful, well, welcome. And thank you for sending the film, we love it. Then we can go to Kelly. Hi there, uh, I'm Kelly Milner. I am the writer, uh, producer, and director of Not About Me. Um, it's a feature documentary. Uh, it features uh, a young woman named Morgan Weinberg, who's from Northern Canada, the Yukon, my hometown. Um, and she went to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010 as an orphanage volunteer right out of high school. Um, and then she basically spent the past 10 years um, learning maybe how we can help better in situations uh, where we want to go and give aid the idea of you know the unintended consequences of good intentions um, and so I'm really really excited to finally be sharing this film it has been a labor of love and uh, it actually features 10 years of footage um, that I'm like the fourth filmmaker who kind of got access to this footage and so it's it's been really cool to put it all together and tell the story and you can actually see you know, Morgan growing up um, on the screen. So I'm really happy to be sharing it with people. Thank you, thank you, welcome. Uh, then we have Aviva. Hi, my name's Aviva Armour Ostroff. Kelly, that sounds amazing. 10 years of footage, wow. <clears throat> I am the 
co-writer and co-director and actor in a feature film, narrative film called Loon. Great. <laughs> we will come back a little bit so you can tell, or maybe you can tell just a, a little log line about what it's about, Aviva. Sure. It's, uh, it takes place in Toronto in 1994, and it's the story of Miriam, the character that I play, um, who is a South African Jew. And Nelson Mandela is about to get elected, and that as well as the introduction of her daughter Eliza's new Black boyfriend. It triggers a manic episode in the bipolar Miriam. And so it's basically the journey of the mother and daughter kind of riding out the bipolar, the manic episode. Wonderful. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious film, uh, but it is also- Some, some, it, joke, some jokes in there. There's some there jokes. There are some jokes, yes. We yeah. did, the, the, the audiences were, you could, it was like a roller coaster in the audience and people were laughing and then they were all, oh. <laughs> so it, it really, it offers both. Yeah, and it's wonderful. Thank you and welcome. Welcome here. Um, Christine, we're going to start with you. Your uh, film, it's, uh, it's an animation and it has uh, um, murals, hand painted uh, or, or aerosol artist, uh, artistry that took seven years to make. Can you tell us a little bit about, about this and what is this aerosol art? All right, so Johnny Crow is a short film that uh, Jesse Coche and I made, and it was based on a poem that I wrote uh, that's really about the warrior spirit and the kind of like the, the displacement of the warrior spirit in today's culture, where it's, you don't go out and fight hand to hand and die. And so where does this spirit live in people? And so that's kind of where it started. So I kind of wrote the imagery for that and then Jesse started animating it. Jesse's a really gifted painter and animator and so aerosol art meaning like spray paint or graffiti art. So he was like animating huge large scale murals. So it's not just like a single figure kind of being animated frame by frame. He's like painting the entire background and then animating uh, characters on top of the background which took forever because you'd have to like, you know, the opening scene is like a bird flying across this kind of street scene and so you have to paint over as you paint the bird and paint over and paint the bird and paint over and paint the bird so it was like a really complex uh series of images and, and we're talking like two meters tall and two meters wide we're talking really large scale here oh yeah much bigger than that like the you know a, a wall of a small warehouse over here and things like that the back of a garage and so it was like getting locations and then, you know, eventually the owners would be like, okay, I just want it to be white now. And so we'd find another location and he can only really paint in the summertime. And so it's 24 frames a second and it's a seven minute long film. So I don't know what the math is. I guess I better do that for these kind of chats. But it was a really um, intense process on that level. And then as we wrote the imagery, we also, you know, talked about, we'd done a project, I had done a project in jail where a lot of the indigenous men that I met there had discovered their spirituality through the program in the jail. And so there's that kind of element of the young man going to jail, like getting arrested for a really minor thing, ending up in jail, fighting and staying there longer and kind of showing the resilience and resistance of indigenous culture and how even even there the, the the spirituality can still kind of help people and so he eventually is reunited with his son which is what the piece is really about is like his his attachment to his son and being uh, separated from his son there's references to the residential school system separating people as well but it's very poetic and then in the end, I felt like my poem wasn't really relevant anymore. And so we worked with um, a, a poet from Yukulet, Michalis Tucci, who wrote a poem for it that is really speaking to his experience as someone who was apprehended from his family and his tribe only got 
treaty status i don't know 10 years or something like that and i'm just so, gonna say quickly there's something with the microphone uh i th think you're um uh, uh, like you're touching the microphone when you're talking oh you're right or is there paper <laughs> on it yeah <laughs> oh my god just, uh, okay. say the last sentence once more yeah mitch listucci is a really gifted spoken word artist from the west coast and so we worked with him to he wrote his own poem, like just his interpretation of uh, his experience through colonialism and being apprehended and the ongoing struggle of indigenous people and of his tribe particularly. And so he wrote a poem that that's the spoken word that you hear over top of the imagery. So it's kind of like taken the imagery to a different level, to a personal level of the poet that we worked with. Oh, it's wonderful. Seven years of ginormous mural art. It's uh, it, it coming together to a film, which was how many minutes was it? It's about seven minutes. Seven long. minutes. Yes, that's one year per minute. <laughs> that Pretty is much. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the result is. I mean, it's it's just basically a piece of art. It's so uh, enjoyable to watch these. Uh, you feel the difference, right? When it's it's um, the handmade uh, art as opposed to like computer art, you just feel it, and it really comes through the screen. And, but then it's also got this this extreme power in the in the words and in in the in the way it's put together. What, what was your uh, what what do you hope uh, to achieve with this film? What is your goal with with having made this art? Uh, well, I guess to bring awareness to the ongoing struggle of Canada to reconcile with Indigenous folks, because I really think that white Canada thinks that they have to reconcile to us. They have to reconcile to our system, but it's not really like that. It's more like we need to reconcile to the fact that we are all here because of that treaty system. And because of the promises we made and broke and made and broke. And so I hope that the, the film just shows some empathy of, of what a young man goes through on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we did a project before this of a Indigenous woman that was murdered behind my home and Jesse did spray paint animation for that. And so this is kind of like the other side of like this young man with a child and the woman is missing. It's, it's not explicitly about that, but that is a whole other piece of like what happens to those family when these women are murdered or go missing and how they have to try to cope without that central figure in their lives. Oh, it's just so important work. And we are we're really, really proud to have the film with us here and to be able to share it with our audiences. It's, it's I mean, it's just right up our alley. Um, Aviva? Thank you. I'm wondering if any of the murals are still left up. Uh, well, some of them are like there's um, there's a crow. The crow kind of symbolizes the young man and symbolizes his kind of like willingness to carry on his spirit in a certain way. And so Jesse painted crows all over the place. So I know one neighbor still has a crow on their garage because he painted a flight sequence on their garage. And uh, he painted a major part of it on this little tiny weird brick cube that's over just a couple blocks from here. Um, like the opening sequence, you see this crow fly in and then he kind of looks at the camera. That's all white now. And then he painted the young man kind of smoking on the other side. And then the crow flies around and you watch the Twin Towers fall unbelievably. And that's all painted over. Um, so I think they do maybe exist uh, somewhere, but not the ones that were painted right around here. The, the mural that he painted for the woman that was murdered behind my house, that still exists. It's still on my garage and it's never been tagged or anything else like that. Yeah, I, I love that, that the crows are still like wild birds scattered. Yeah, that's wonderful, what a beautiful imagery. 
thank you for the film. Thank you for having made it. Thank you for having shared it with us. We really, we love it. And we, we appreciate the film a lot here at the Anchorage International Film Festival. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for selecting it. We're really honored to be part of the festival. Thank you. Um, Gwyn and Brianna, mm -hmm. that's, uh, now we're going from animation to <laughs> narrative short comedy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start by by telling a little bit? Uh, it's it's a really kind of crazy story you guys have come up with here, and as an audience, you just get like mesmerized into this madness world. Can you tell us a little bit about this wonderful piece? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Brianna, you look like you're about to speak. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we um, well, Gwen and I have worked together for a long time as a as a comedy duo, uh, doing live shows and other shorts and things like that. Uh, and we got funding to make this film from the Toronto Outdoor Picture Show, which has been running for ten years in Toronto at Christy Pitts uh, Park and some other parks in Toronto. Uh, and it was their 10th anniversary and so they had a, a challenge for filmmakers who had participated in the festival to like create a film based on like a classic movie that they had played before oh. uh so we selected uh whatever happened to baby jane and that was kind of the uh jumping off point for like all right let's make a film based on that movie, uh, which was a really fun challenge. And the result is uh, The Women's Hour. Um, and it centers around sort of 1950s Hollywood and two uh, actors who are, who are rivals. And they appear in like um, uh, 1950s like thriller where one of them murders the other and then uh, we end up seeing what happens to them in in real life. The lines begin to blur between yeah. the um, film within a film and the actual world and how it how they interact and and there's this sort of unreliable narrator um, who I play and um, it's it be it begin it just gets crazy it just goes a little wild so. And I think in comedy, it's important to heighten the stakes as much as possible. So I think that, you know, our film does that in another way. And I, and we, we do have a history of, of making a lot of sort of horror comedy fusion uh, films. So that is definitely where this one went. Yeah. I was wondering about that because it's a film about jealousy, rivalry, careers, sabotage and murder. How on earth do you make us laugh about this? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, um, I guess like for us, a lot of that stuff is, well, we, first of all, we love old films. Like we watch old movies all the time. It's like our favorite thing to do. And I think camp is like our, maybe our favorite, I guess it's a genre um, and like, something about that earnestness that that like extreme jealousy and sort of like women pitted against each other it is you know it does exist it's stressful obviously it's you know and we're at the time in our lives when it's kind of like this is kind of happening with people's careers they are kind of getting to a certain point and and i think but then there's something really funny about it too because it's just it's not that important it's just you know it's it's ridiculous and it's you know it's the way that the industry is and it's just I think you have to laugh about it otherwise you're just gonna like drive yourself crazy or something mm -hmm. and boy did we laugh I mean the, the film is really funny and I think one of the things that just like makes it is the acting we were really just like we were just uh, suggerated oh, is that English sucked into <laughs> I could do it yeah great sucked well into. if you did that this That's woman's cool. mind and the and the acting was just was so well done can you tell a little bit about what method you use to find that to find that role <laughs> um oh the old lady the i mean sorry no spoilers but the older woman mm -hmm. oh um well i actually saw a photo of um elizabeth taylor in her older years um when she had like really dyed blonde hair and and her wearing a lot of sort of like smudged turquoise makeup and stuff and a lot of like strange blouses. And um, I just thought, you know, 
this is a woman who was so glamorous and so you know like who knows what she was thinking at that time in her life you know she was quite she was in her 80s I think at that point um maybe late 70s but she but it was just the idea of like this is a woman who has had such a career and and seen so much and been around forever and had a crazy life and now and this is like how she presents herself and it's like whatever it just really I just loved it so I thought okay if I can like somehow incorporate that look and that vibe into the character and then she's also crazy so you know you're you're, you're, not, you're not sure what she's saying if anything she's saying is true um but then you also feel for her because she you know she really does love this person but it's complicated and yeah so um I think it everything comes from truth and so if you can find like the element of truth in it and then it, it'll become funny if you just make it as real as possible or like as true to the character yeah oh i love that yeah well we we loved the film we laughed and we laughed and we were really impressed by it it was really it, it's uh it's a film we're very very excited about having at the festival very proud to have here thank you so much also i wanted to uh give a shout out to our production company that we worked with yes. uh, larue productions and our director allison johnson were fantastic to work with and we had this very ambitious like okay so it's like 16 minutes but there's three different time periods and they <laughs> they made it all happen and it was really, it was really and great. we did a the fight sequence at five in the morning. So kudos to Brianna for- uh, <laughs> Why did you do it so early in the morning? It was just the way the schedule was when you're working on a budget, um, which we always are. And I, yeah, I don't know. It was the way, the only way I could fit it in is that we had to somehow do the entire fight sequence at 5 a.m. So- In I, evening gowns, which was very fun. <laughs> so that in itself is funny. I mean, we didn't yeah. really have to do anything. It just becomes funny because we, you know, you have that kind of like commitment to the scene at five in the morning. It's like, things are going to go haywire no matter what. And you're also like a little like tired, crazy where everything yeah. is funny. And <laughs> if you, you're kind of in the state of like madness at five in the morning, I find yes. before the coffee totally. has, has hit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for making the film and thank you so much for sharing it with us. We are so excited to have it at Anchorage International Film Festival. Thank you so much. Thanks it's an honor to be part of the Anchorage Film Festival again. Yay. Yeah. Oh, actually, let's talk about that quickly because you guys are alumni. Well, we are. I guess only by a year, but our old, our previous film was called Alaska. So that was great that we got to uh, have it screened in Alaska. I mean, of all places. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Yeah, well, we love our alumni here. And uh, we're gonna skip the order a little bit because uh, there's two connections here. So Aviva, you are also an alumni. Three, four years ago in 2017, you had a wonderful film Drawer Boy here. Yes, I think it was 2018. Oh, was it? Okay. I think so. It oh, was right I... before you took over the festival. Oh, okay. All right. So then mm -hmm. that, that might yeah. be, yes. Um, you were a filmmaker. I was a, oh, that was 2017 then. It was? Okay. Yeah. In Perfect. 17, I was a filmmaker. Yeah. And then yeah. after, yeah um well it, no matter it's a wonderful wonderful film and you have managed to overdo yourself and follow up with just an absolutely breathtaking film oh, uh man. where again the acting is really the, the just like in center here aviva we are so proud of you oh thanks so, like we are so proud of you I, it's a uh, it's a really wonderful film you made. We are, everybody are just like, we're blown to the floor. So oh. thank you for sharing it with us. Can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration of the film? Because acting like that, that must come from somewhere. Um, yes, it comes from, uh, well, I was gonna make a joke, but <laughs> I, um, I uh, the story is based on my real life. Uh, I basically play a version of my dad. So my dad and I obviously grew up together. Um, and he was a South African Jew, transplant to Canada, and um, suffered from bipolar disorder, or what I was told was manic depression, called manic depression at the time. And when he would have a manic episode, he would get really political and really anti-apartheid and 
um, either really pro-religion or anti-religion, mostly anti-religion, um, anti-Jew, which he was. <clears throat> and so when I was in grade 12, I wrote a play that was basically a transcript of my life at the time. And then 25 or 30 years later, I changed the character from a man to a woman so that I could selfishly play the character. So, and then, so I, I workshopped that as a play and had like a shitty first draft of a play before I wrote it into a screenplay. So that was a, around the time that I fell in love with filmmaking and so made it into a film and we shot it at the end of 2019 slid in there right before the pandemic how, yeah. how was it to act kind of your father because it's a really sensitive i mean the thing with the main character in the film is that it's it's a person who's behaving quite poorly but you also really love them so it's this du dual feeling in it right i mean yeah. we're rooting for the mom but we're also getting really frustrated on behalf of the daughter of what the mom is doing and putting the daughter through. How is it to act, not only act that dualism, but that it's based on your own father? Yeah. Um, it was actually really fun. Yeah. I had- Good to hear. <laughs> yeah. I had a really incredible team around me, um, including my partner, Arturo, who co-directed with me. So, there was room for me to just be an actor when I could be an actor. And um, it was a really supportive space to play in. And I guess because I had been processing these feelings or childhood <laughs> traumas most of my life, it felt, wasn't, I, I don't want to say it was cathartic because it didn't feel very much like a therapy piece. It felt it felt more like a, an homage to my dad mm. and so it was fun to bring out those elements of joy or surprise or or good times so that you would be able to love the character and not only be annoyed by them <laughs> and we really do I mean it's uh it's uh it's a heartbreaking film where it's a heartbreaking film with humor and with hope almost uh, because yeah. you know it comes full circle towards the end and and you do see the love she has for her daughter and the support she gives to the daughter and and um, and that connection that they have too so so it definitely has a lot of positive points in it. and talking about the daughter what dream team was that huh Mike and Eliza yeah where did you find those two gems um through the power of auditioning <laughs> I found them both and it really at the end like there's so much talent in Toronto um I could have cast the part of my daughter with many I, I really like to work with theater artists um but I also wanted somebody that you could believe was a dancer as well and that was Chloe she's a dancer and She's a nurse in real life, like she's an actor, but she's a nurse. So that quality of caregiver really added a whole other element to the, to the part. And Vlad too, I had to fight for him. He was like, no, thanks. And I was like, no, please. He didn't want to be in the film? Well, he didn't, he, he, the way he describes it now is he was about to go on a trip. And so he didn't want to have to deal with an audition. And then I came back to him and then he read the script and was like, okay. Oh yeah, well, we're very glad. When yeah. I watched the film the other day again and I leaned over to John and I said, it's, I'm so, I'm, it's so comfortable when he's on screen. He's got such a comfortable character. You just want to just just rest there <laughs> with him yeah he's it's a, he and he gives that uh like a contrast almost to the main character but then they also find each other i love the scene when Lisa comes home and he has a flower in the face yeah and she and it was it's just it's so such contrasts that are just beautiful it's really Good. wonderful symbiosis on the screen oh uh, we we're in a house in alaska with the 
filmmakers here. So uh, one of our filmmakers, who you know Aviva, just walked in the kitchen to grab a glass of milk or, yep. <laughs> Uh, so that's Dan Murray. She's saying hi. Hi, Dan. <laughs> hi, Viva. <laughs> this is what happens when you're an alumni at the festival. You just become part of the family. So everybody keep making films and send them in and become part of our family. Oh, Dan is coming over here. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome hi. to Alaska. Dan is here this year with his film 18 and a half which is screening on Wednesday so we're excited about that. Uh, Aviva what what do you um, I mean obviously for you it's been a really um, is sort of is not soothing maybe but like an important piece to make about the things you grew up with what do you hope that the audiences to take away from your film? Um, I hope it destigmatizes mental health a little bit. There's more and more conversations about mental health. Um, and that's such a huge umbrella. We say mental health, but there's a lot of, <laughs> that means a lot of things. So I guess specifically uh, bipolar and maybe educate people to what that is a little bit more, that it's not um, just a caricature of that uh, condition and then I also hope that it elicits tough conversations about race and religion and I hope it makes people talk yeah because your film it really I mean it goes there it goes there and then it goes further and then it actually goes even further than that there are so many uh, episodes in the film that are really daring and brave to have gone all the way and and extremely uncomfortable to watch but also very um it's it's like you you're you're it's a kudos that you have dared to go all the way with it it feels like a very very raw portrayal um how, how was it to go all that way um well, scary, for sure. Um, necessary, I think, especially in the last couple of years where uh, it seems like all of a sudden white people are waking up to the fact that there's racism and all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, we've got to combat racism, but it's actually quite complex. And I, I fear that there's <clears throat> a desire to sort of shut it down and be like, well, racism is bad, the end, as opposed to really examining our own prejudices and our own bias. And that's the only way that we're gonna really affect change. So um, yeah, it was definitely scary. And I mean, we made it before George Floyd was murdered. And so a lot of the conversations in the film we had to revisit them. Um, and I, I hope that they became more potent. Um, and I, I definitely, there's two, uh, one of the major characters is a black man and then there's the woman that plays his mother. So there was a lot of dialogue with them because I'm writing characters that I am not, I am not a black woman, so I don't know what it is to be a black woman or a black man. So there was a lot of conversation with them about the script. And um, Vlad actually has a writing credit in the film, like a consultant credit as, as well as there's um, a piece of work that he brought that he wrote in the film. So hopefully I was inclusive. He says I was, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think nope. that's something that the audiences notices too, because when the film goes to those areas that are so uncomfortable and you're kind of thinking, oh, oh, can they say this? This, is, you know, you're looking around a little bit, but then you feel, no, no, this is the filmmaker who has taken those precautions and have, have collaborated and have their own experiences. Um, and it makes the audiences sort of trust 
that that uh, that it is a safe space almost yeah and you you yeah. notice that in the film yeah that's good to hear thank you well thank you so much aviva for the film it's just it's just it's just wonderful. <laughs> I really we wish I was there with you guys right now. Oh, we friend. wish so too. And I think Dan <laughs> wishes that too, huh, Dan? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but next film, next film, you're going to have to come up here because we really want to see you again. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank Kelly, you Hi. made a film, Hi, that has taken 10 years to make. Yes, actually, it's probably now more like 12 if you include everybody who's been involved. Yes, that is remarkable, but it really paid off. Huh? What a film you yeah. made. What well, an thanks. important film Thank and you. what an important discussion it started. Yeah, no, I think this was, um, I mean, this film was really a very pleasant surprise uh, and a much bigger film than I thought I was getting into. Um, you know, I, it started with uh, basically a hard drive of footage um, and Morgan, the woman that the film is about, um, her mom brought it to me and was like, hey, you know what? There's all this footage that people have been collecting about Morgan. Um, she's from my hometown of Whitehorse. And, you know, would you want to do something with it? And I think when we first looked at it, we thought, oh, maybe this will be like, you know, a half hour profile video about a Yukon girl who went somewhere and did something great. And as I started um, looking into the footage and, and actually got to meet Morgan, um, she was like, yeah, I'm super glad. I'd be happy for you to do something about it. But as long as the film is not about me. And uh, for me, that was like, made me really rethink what the story was that she wanted to tell. And so, yeah, that comes back to, you know, as somebody who went to Haiti with really good intentions, you know, as a 18 year old who wanted to go save the world um, and then working in an volunteering at an orphanage and really understanding that it's institutionalization of children and it's, you know, a for profit industry and unwittingly, you know, it's we're the ones who are helping prop it up. Um, I think for her trying to find a way to tell that story and reach um, a North American audience and to help them see, you know, how maybe we need to change some of our behaviors and change our mentality uh, when it comes to helping others. Um, and I think that that's been, that's a much bigger story <laughs> than I thought I was going to be telling initially. Um, but I'm really grateful because I've learned so much uh, in, in doing this and I feel like it was just such a gift. And like I said, the, the footage that was there, what made it so interesting as a filmmaker is, you know, we could actually go on the journey with Morgan. The audience can see her transformation over time. Um, you can see her in some really awkward scenarios that are kind of embarrassing and, um, you know, something that only an 18 year old would let somebody film them doing because they think that it's actually the right thing to do. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's really great about the film and I really appreciate Morgan agreeing to let us share um, some of that, you know, not always the most, um, the best uh, examples, but I think showing how that actually changes over time, it really is um, we can really empathize with her as a character. And, and I think that's the intention is to let people go through that process and, and go along with her and sort of learn from her mistakes. Yeah, because what you've done here is that you've taken sort of a, um, how can I call it, almost like a political bullet point and you've made it into an adventure that an audience can really follow and experience together with Morgan. And I just, mm -hmm. I, one thing that, that like, that stands out so much for me with this film is that it's the forwardness of it, like how forward thinking this film is. It really is the next step of the discussion. It's a it's a discussion that we sometimes hear in sort of like academic circles um, where, did we lose someone here? I think we lost uh, Christine. Oh, there she is. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Christine. Um, yeah, it's, it's a discussion we sometimes hear in academic circles about like how how can we help? How should we help? And is the, that it is and can be very damaging that people who don't actually know what they're doing goes to help. But it it hasn't yet sort of seed the down to the masses, right? It, it, it hasn't come there yet. And to get a film 
that is so forward thinking and puts like tomorrow's agenda on on our program that's that's well pretty rare honestly I mean, we get forward thinking films but but this one was really sort of turning everything upside down uh and i loved that i i just i loved it i thought it was such an important film and and a film that I, I want I just want everybody to see it and, and to learn about this. <laughs> Can you tell a little bit about sorry? Yeah, no, I'm great. <laughs> I'm super <laughs> happy for more people to see it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. I think it's a really important story. And I mean, I think it touches on a lot of things that I mean other people have mentioned. I mean, I think when we look at, you know, uh, institutionalization of children and Christina, you know, like talking about our own history in Canada, we have a long history of this and, you know, the fact that it's being perpetuated in other places that we're helping support it, you know, we need to be really reflecting on that we need to be reflecting on things like our own inherent racism and how that plays into, you know, our approach when we go um to be white saviors or what is it that we're trying to do i mean is it really about helping people or is it about us feeling better um like there's a lot of different layers to it and and i think that that's the intention is to really spark conversations around that mm -hmm. and um i think you know your question you know what what are we trying to do with this sort of conversation and push it um, again, I really appreciate Morgan in that when she wanted to share the story, she had a really clear intention and really wanting to reach out and, and connect with young people. Um, that was her, her main uh, objective. This was to share the story and reach people who were just like her, you know, when you're just out of high school and you want to go volunteer and you're going to go travel and you're going to go do great things. And, and that is such a great energy that you want people to maintain you want people to feel like you can save the world but is there a way we can do it in a better way and so um you know a big part of the film it's it's the film is one thing but as we were building the film we've also been building a whole impact campaign around it and it includes a whole it's like a 30 page school discussion guide that's targeted at high school students and um you know, really sort of gets in and, and creates some some different conversations around the different topics, um, lots of different uh, activities and things that uh, young people can do that, you know, to do a little bit more research to go a little bit further. And I think that's Morgan's message is, you know, really think about it, re examine what is the motivation of, of going and, and helping. Um, are you helping in the right place? Are you involving locals? Are you being respectful for, for what is being needed? And um, yeah, I think if anything, if we can just move the dial a little bit and getting people to think about these things, it, I think it will, it will help in the future for sure. Do you think that there is an easy solution to it? Because I feel like it's, I love what you're, you're mentioning that there's so much positive energy for, from young people who want to do good in the world. But I think it's sort of, you know, and I, I speak as one of them myself, you know, I was like 16, 17 when I, I went to, to work with refugees at a, at a situation where I, even while being there, I realized I'm not sure I'm doing much good here. I think I'm actually sort of damaging this. I was just too young. I was just simply too young to, to be able to, to, to help in a constructive manner without having like the the proper system around me to guide my my energy as you would call it um and what happens then of course is that the young people they end up becoming passive afterwards because they just don't know wh what to do with the energy or the resources one has do you think there is an an easy solution or at least a solution to this and and how we can help out like how should we help well, I mean, I don't think there is an easy solution and I wish that there was and I think that's kind of the point is we have to really think about these things and we have to start examining what are our own motivations like are we just doing things that it's so easy to click, you know, donate it's so easy to just sign up for a volunteer tour without really doing the homework like giving that up to other people. And so if anything it's it. I know that sounds sort of depressing, but in some ways, I think it has to be the solution for lots of things is taking the time. And I mean, 
I know that we shared it, I think, with your festival, but one of the things we're getting now that we've started screening it with people is people saying, okay, well, what do we do? So, you know, we've created things like a donor's checklist, like basic things that people should be looking for before you donate to an organization. You know, here's four things that you should think about, you know, are they registered? Do they have their you know, their financial records are like little basic things. I mean, even just starting there, getting people aware of, of some of that literacy. And then when it comes to volunteering, you know, are you going somewhere where you're actually gonna be helping? Um, are you actually qualified to do this? And the film really focuses on orphanages in particular because that's a very big draw for a lot of young volunteers. And it is an industry in itself. Um, and I think that that's something that is important for people to understand um, that, you know, most of these children, 80% of the children in these uh, institutions have someone who could be taking care of them um, and that they are there for, for all sorts of different reasons, um, primarily poverty and the fact that international money goes to institutions because we all feel safer giving to these places when really we should be supporting the families. So we're dealing with the root cause of why they're giving their, their children up in the first place. And, um, and I think just also understanding how unregulated that is, um, the industry itself. And so, you know, these are really big topics, but even when it came to the basic, even just the word orphanage, um, I think we have this idea that in, another country, you know, that an orphanage means something good. It's a good, it's a safe place for kids to go, but we don't even, we don't have them here. We don't have them in Canada. We learned a long time ago um, in the United States, uh, you know, this isn't a, institutionalizing children isn't a good thing. It doesn't have good results. Um, and that children are much better raised in, uh, in a family setting. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's really trying to help young people think in particular about the orphanage um, scenario and are there better ways for them to support and there are lots of things that that can be done um, but it is just taking that time to do some research and figuring out what is the best thing you can offer um, and what is it that people need because we're always happy to offer but we don't often take the time to listen to hear what actually people would like from us yeah yeah i remember there was a uh... A, a refugee camp that we were in a few years ago where they had so many shoes there were just heaps and heaps of shoes and they're like we don't need any more shoes we need legal advice no more <laughs> shoes right people no keep donating shoes, shoes. <laughs> yeah um well, and it's funny there's the there's one scene in the film that is about shoes i don't know if you remember it but um about a, a group that comes to donate shoes at the orphanage where morgan's a volunteer and then what happens to those shoes as soon as everybody leaves and i know for lots of people who watch the film you know that is a really it's a it's an it's a scene that really sticks out in their mind because it is something that you know we all think it's great to oh they're going to need shoes or they're going to need this but it just becomes part of the system yeah. and uh yeah we need to be aware that our good intentions can have very negative consequences how has the reception of the film been? Because it shouldn't be controversial, but of course, when you are showing uh, or like um, in the region, you are like disclosing a scam on one end, but you're also kind of showing to people a mirror where you're saying what you thought you did that was good wasn't good. How have people reacted to the film? I mean, I think we were nervous initially, um, but at the same time, I mean, of all the screenings we've done, and we've done a lot of screenings, particularly with young people, I mean, that's been really a focus. And I find that those are really, the feedback has been really um, positive. I think because Morgan is so vulnerable as the character, it it doesn't feel as contra it doesn't feel like it's controversial um, because you see her making the mistakes. And so it doesn't necessarily have it kind of lets you off the hook, to be honest, um, because you can watch Morgan go through it without necessarily having to wear it yourself. Um, and so I think that it's maybe a gentle, uh, a gentle way for people to have those realizations. And um, 
And I think because Morgan is kind of a, a gracious uh, storyteller in herself, um, she sort of gives people a lot of opportunity to, for that self-reflection. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a wonderful film, and we are we are so glad and honored to to be able to share it here at Anchorage International Film Festival and to 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 share the message with our audience. It's, it's a it's very important this film. So thank you for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Totally happy. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> we're going to take a quick round here and just hear what everybody's new projects are. So we can start with Christine. What uh, do you have any upcoming projects that we can look forward to? Yeah, um, the most recent or the one that's coming up is uh, a film by Tank Standing Buffalo. He's a Black Potawatomi mixed artist. He's doing a short called Savage. It's about his uh, his experience when his him and his seven siblings all lived in a provincial park for a summer when they their mom was uh, institutionalized, and so they kind of lived uh, pretty ferally until they were apprehended by Children's Aid and taken away. And so that's an animated film, and he loves horror, so it has like these kind of horror elements and you know kind of fantastical elements and we're also working on a blackfoot language um animation as well by celestine twig who's a blackfoot language teacher and tank is animating that so those two films are coming up next year oh that's wonderful we look forward to them you bet <laughs> thank you christy uh then you can go to uh, gwyn and brianna any upcoming projects um, well, we're currently writing a feature. So that's been in the works for about, I don't know, six months now or so. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping to get that finished in the next month or so. It's almost there. Um, and then uh, is there anything else, Brianna? That we... Oh, you're muted. Uh, you, we have, um, a lot of other like sh shorts and things like that online, including, well, Alaska, which was <laughs> an Anchorage alumni film. So as a fellow Canadians, um, you can also watch that still on, uh, CBC Gem. I think it's still on there as well, which is really fun. And, uh, we have an audible series called None of Our Business, which is all audio sketches and stuff. Check that out too. Very active. That's awesome. Well, we look forward to to the feature. That sounds fun. We'll see. We're we're working. We're working <laughs> away. <laughs> Aviva, any new upcoming projects? No, I got nothing. Yeah. It it <laughs> took all the energy out of huh? making loon. Yeah, I'm gonna go meet Arturo in Mexico. And I'm sure we'll find some inspiration there. He has built a beautiful house there that is just calling, needs to be filmed in. So That's Gwen and if Brianna. You need to be the case. If you ever need, if you ever need um, yeah. actors for your film, you know, we're available, yeah. especially around February, March. Yeah, maybe you have to write in a Mexican theme into your feature. Ooh, I, I might be going, I might be going there in February, so, you know. Okay, well, let me know if you do. Be inspired. Okay. <laughs> this is wonderful. We love when filmmakers sort of find each other on our yeah. on our Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that that's wonderful. Yeah, I think uh, a well deserved vacation and some some downtime is is in order, Aviva. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kelly, do you have any upcoming projects we can look forward to? Um, yeah, I, uh, I I'm taking a bit of a break from documentary, uh, it's felt like pretty heavy. So I'm working on actually a kids puppet series. Um, basically if uh, the Muppets and Hinterlands Who's Who had a baby, it would be sort of like that. Ooh, um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Get to work with some puppets. And then I'm also working with a friend uh, on, um, I don't know what we should call it. Uh, it's like a do it yourself series uh, for women um that's like all the stuff that people don't necessarily learn how to do Alaskans will appreciate this but like how to chop wood how to back up a trailer 
um, those types of things, but she's this character that uh, we've shot it all looks look, kind of looks like an old black and white film like the damsel in distress, but she's she's totally not she's a damsel of determination. Oh, that's UConn awesome. gets, gets her done. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, so those those have been pretty fun and totally different and yeah. I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> and how appropriate isn't that with this meeting repair of all these women who also get stuff done and have made these fantastic films. Exactly. Yes. Um, I think I think we can just start first. By, oh, hello. Somebody wants to say <laughs> hi. <laughs> I think first, uh, what is in order here is a little bit of an applause for you guys. Just what wonderful films. We're just, just over the moon about all of them. They're, we're so glad to have them in the festival. And this was just four of the amazing Canadian films that's in Anchorage International Film Festival this year. But there are actually 16 films from Canada. So you guys are very well represented. Uh, I'm going to read up uh, the, the films. It was uh, four features and 12 shorts. So we have Captive, Eternal Igloo, Far Away, Freemas, Girls Shouldn't Walk Alone at Night, Johnny Crow, Like the Ones I Used to Know, Loon, Moon, so pretty similar names there, Not About Me, Personals, Second Wedding, See You Garbage, The Danger in Front, the Women's Hour, and we're all in this together. 16 films, huh, from Canada. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> and just here today, we've had a narrative feature, a doc feature, an animation, and a narrative short. So you're also just really well represented here in, here in the meeting. It, girls, it's been absolutely wonderful to talk to you and to hear more about your beautiful projects. We are so proud of everything that you've done and that you have shared it with us. We couldn't be happier about it. So thank you so much. And thank you to Canada for, you know, making sure you guys can make these films and share them with us. And of course, for sponsoring the festival. So we can do an applause for Canada too. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the chat. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.